So I want to uh, thank my advisor, Rebecca Brown, and the rest of the MFA faculty for supporting me. I also want to thank my friends and my cohort, my brother, Ben, my mom, Grams, and my partner, Quaylen, for listening to my incessant rants about fictional characters. Without all of you, me, then this work wouldn't be here today. My thesis, Bed of Leaves, is an original book-length work of fiction. Before we start, I would like to read from my abstract for some context. <clears throat> when her brother Arthur disappears, Cassie is the last to see him. Guilt-ridden and pushed aside by her mother, her classmates, and the very community she calls home, Cassie is forced to seek her answers in the one place she has left, the woods. But the forest is not all that it seems. As she steps beneath the cops of trees, Cassie begins to realize that she is not alone. So in this next section, I'll be reading three different excerpts today. Um, in this next section from chapter four, Cassie continues her search for Arthur, her brother, but what she finds in the woods is not her brother, but more questions. I slipped into my boots, threw on my coat, grabbed my mom's flashlight, and eased the screen door closed behind me. Outside, the air was heavy and damp. I kept my flashlight off as I closed, crossed the backyard, glancing at Mr. Garrisby and Devon's house, where a single light still glinted in one of the windows. Beneath the trees, the mist pressed in, Thick white sheets hung between the trunks, and in the woods my mind did the same, fog covering up the questions and the narrow glances and the silhouetted faces. There was just the next step and the next black stalk sprouting up in front of me. Roots tripped me as I walked, but I waited until I was deep under the cover of the branches before switching on my flashlight. The forest silence stretched out around me. But that was comforting in a way the house hadn't been. At the edge of my awareness came the hush of the breeze and the sound of my footsteps. My thoughts centered on my goal and my vision narrowed to the point of my flashlight. We'd looked at our spot, but mom and the cops wouldn't have known of the other places. Places where we'd played follow the leader or tried to find the strongest still, a stick or built secret weapons out of fallen branches and long grass. I breathed in and the forest seemed to breathe too. I turned at a familiar broken tree and toward the stream that wound through the woods. My flashlight found nothing but rocks and glinting water in that rivulet. I crossed the river and went deeper in, following my feet. I kept the flashlight on to watch for the roots I didn't know. I was going to find him. I went to our safe house, this thick fort we built after I came back from sixth grade camp. It leaned up against a tree. Arthur must have been coming out here since last summer because I was sure it had toppled the last time I'd seen it. A fresh roof of needles and thick leaves covered parts of the branches. The glint of silver in the back was probably another stash of mandarin oranges from the house. Arthur insisted on keeping the stores fresh just in case. He'd had the biggest smile when he had come back with the little cans spilling out of his sweater pockets. And we don't even need a can opener he'd said, tapping the tab lids. But no matter where I slipped the flashlight, Arthur didn't jump out of the shadows. No one-chewed footsteps marked the ground. I shivered and tried not to imagine Arthur shivering in the dark. It was just like helping mom find her keys. It was always the last place he looked. Just keep looking. I tried to keep my steps even, but my heartbeat filled the silence. The stone we'd painted with paintballs washed clean by a Pacific Northwest rain. The pool we'd dug eroded into an oblong blob, the sapling to which we'd sung growing songs choked by a thick bush. Let's see if I can scroll pages. Keep looking. My flashlight swung back and forth with my jogging legs. My breath clouded the air. Keep running, keep searching. My legs burned, my chest ached, my feet pounded the forest floor. The crossing log empty, bow and arrow ridge silent, the sludge abandoned. One more place. I turned away from the marsh. Spikes filled my lungs, my feet dragged. I stepped into the clearing. This place was empty except for a solitary gray stone in the middle of the gap between the trees. A deep rivet cut into the middle of it. 
my fingers traced the divots Arthur's rough pestle had scratched into it. I could almost see him there, hear him humming off tune to himself. Almost. I fell to the earth and my knees sank into the dirt. I leaned on the cold rock. That pressure that had hung over me pressed down and I fell with it. Sobs shook me, tears fell down my cheeks. I turned my back to the rock, hugging my knees to my chest and closing my eyes. I tried to pay attention to my breathing. The wind whispered past, and a few leaves still clinging to their branches rustled above. I pressed my boots into the soil. I trembled, but my breath slowed. The sweet smell of damp earth and wet leaves filled the air. I drew in another slow breath. My gaze shifted hauling deeper through the connection of feet, back, fingers. Thin-stemmed mycena unfurled their invisible networks around me, a spider's labyrinth, domed heads rising in blooming umbrellas. The rock felt cool against my back. A light rain speckled my cheeks and hair. My eyes drooped shut and I sank with them. Sleep pulled at my bones, so tired. I melted the way candles do, wilting into myself and pooling. Droplets dusted my eyelids, but I could see the forest, bark like scales drawing patterns on the trees, tufts of moss spreading across logs, scotch bonnets tracing rings. So much of the forest lay just beneath the surface. Roots moved through the dirt, branching out, turning towards patches of water. The stream trickled over stone and past greedy wooden tendrils that tried to block its flow. Dirt shifted beneath my weight, crumbled away as my fingers flexed. My heart rattled in its bone cage. Some part of me said to come back, screaming from some far distant place in my mind, but there was more. And as my fingers reached deeper, I was more too. My fingernails sought out the patches of water. Rain gathered on the needles of my eyelashes. My hair swayed with the branches. Warmth flooded my limbs, radiating from the inside out. The pool I had become spread and reformed itself, a candle in reverse. The flame poised to disappear before the candle was lit. And then the whisper of breath in my ear, a cupped hand against my cheek. You found me, he said. I shivered, but I didn't feel scared. It was like how walking into a warm room made me realize I'd been cold. I did. But you have to wake up now, he said. Have to, I said. I couldn't remember falling asleep. I'd been there at the rock. Tears had shaken through me, brought me down. Then the earth and the roots and the mushrooms. You're not supposed to be here. The candle climbed back up. Clay crackled at the corners of my vision. Pins prickled legs and feet. But I want to stay, I said. Outside was cold and wet and sad. It was warm here. It was safe here. The voice turned deeper, brusker. It's time to wake up. I don't want to, I said. Roots coiled around my legs and my hands clenched clumps of black dirt. Chill tore into me like a pack of wolves converging on a hunk of meat. I gasped, come back, but the warmth was gone. I blinked the crust out of my eyes. My hands shook from the cold. I scanned the clearing, but I was still alone. If I just closed my eyes, I could see the outline of him, dark curls and a wide smile. The echo of his voice faded, just a dream. In this section from chapter nine, Cassie finds herself back in the forest after ditching school. Uh, feeling alone and guilty, she tries to contact that presence she felt before. I should go home. It was just a short walk. I should call mom. Just get it over with. Explain what had happened and go from there. The cool air wrapped itself around me and wicked the sweat from my brow. But I was already here, I told myself. If mom knew I was home, she would just tell me to stay inside. She might even send Devin to babysit me again. I ducked under low branches and wove my path around trees, not meaning to go anywhere in particular. My feet carried me, and I let them. More needles had shaken themselves free of the trees. They sunk into the soft ground beneath me. The air was sweet and fresh. I slowed, 
I stepped into the clearing from the other night. All was the same, though the spot where I had sat had already evened out. I shook my head at myself. Sorry for the guest. I tried not to think about it, but the last few days it had clung to my mind with a fervor. When I lay down, I could see, feel the braiding of the roots over and around one another, and I could feel the soft crumble of the gravel shifting beneath my fingers. And that voice, understanding and kind. I sat down on the rock, brushing off some of the moss that had grown on its surface, crossing my arms over my chest. I waited. For what? I wasn't sure. I glanced around. The forest was empty. A bird darted in and out of the canopy. The air was still and cold. No boy walked out from around a tree. No one but me. I tried closing my eyes. You can come out now, I said. I had said something similar when a fairy circle had grown on her back lawn. It was a little after Arthur had been born. A mom carried him around in a front backpack wherever she went. I decided I was going to run away, become a daughter of the Fairy Queen. I sat for the whole day in the middle of that circle, eyes scrunched closed. But then it was just the same as now. No one came, no elves whisked me away, no boy came to listen. I was alone. So this last section is a little bit different. Um, throughout this novel, there are third person pocket scenes. Uh, these are anachronistic scenes that feature Arthur, Cassie's lost brother, navigating the woods. This scene takes place in chapter 11. The water burbled and rolled, turning white as it splashed over the fallen branches and log. An unforgiving sun beat down on Arthur, his bare feet flexed in the silty mud. He faced the river, but his focus was on his reflection. It wavered and blurred as if it were trying to resist the pull of the current. What would happen if his reflection just let go? If he stopped looking, would it drift downstream, dissolving into its separate colors until his reflection was no more? A branch leaned out over the water. Cassie used to sit in the crook of it and watch him swim when the river ran slower, but the moss had grown back over her spot. Arthur grabbed onto the branch for support. Its reflection too quivered on the surface. Arthur took a step and the frigid water swept around his foot. The mud was soft and slimy, clouding the clear waters. Arthur's reflection rippled. The flow wasn't strong enough to pull him in too hard yet, but he could feel it tugging at him, urging him to follow the stream along its winding path through the woods. Another step and the water swelled around his ankles. His reflection shrunk with each step. The flow got stronger and stronger. He had to stretch to hold onto the branch, and a few times his feet scrabbled over the silic mud. The cool waters eased the mosquito bites on his calves and made the sun or sun a little more bearable. His reflection smiled back, and Arthur let go. That's all I'm going to share for now. Thanks, friends. <laughs>